This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com. Well, we've got a little issue with the uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> this episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor. Oh, this is hilarious. This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor podcast is brought to you by CRE. I don't know what is going on right now. Sorry, everybody. Please bear with me. I'm going to have to cut this. I can part see out you. Me. I can see you. You in can the see me. Corner. Yep. Let me see. This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. There we go. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast live from the, um, well, I guess not necessarily live from the Cobble Group Studios because we're all over the place, but uh, coming at you with some technical difficulties on a day where we're going to be talking about some parts of commercial real estate where you can actually have some real technical difficulties. We're talking about partnerships, how to structure these deals, how to negotiate equity, how to split up your roles. And uh, it, I could see how this could very easily become a part one and part two, because there's so much that, that is involved here. Um, but I mean, let's be honest, like if you're, whether you're just getting started in commercial real estate or you're doing your 20th deal, partnerships are a great way for you to grow and scale your business. They are also one of the quickest ways for you to lose a whole bunch of money, lose your reputation, and get into a lot of legal trouble. So it is very important that you do it correctly. So starting off, uh, Logan, I'm going to pass it over to you, man. I mean, wh why are partnerships in commercial real estate so important? Yeah, I mean, I think they're not only beneficial, they're often the bedrock of, of substantial portfolio growth. I mean, especially for new investors. I mean, it can be a collaborative approach that can lock, unlock opportunities and scale operations that solo ventures can't. You know, when you're pooling resources, knowledge, and networks in partnership, it can kind of create a synergy that amplifies the strengths of each member, you know, which, which transforms individual capabilities into collective power. However, However, there, there, we have to remind ourselves that the only thing in life that is constant is change. And I have been a part of, I am a part of, I have seen very many different outcomes for business partnerships. I mean, there are so many variables, right? And when you're thinking about real estate investing, we try to figure out what are the variables and, and the, especially the variables that, you know, we can control. Well, the one thing that we can't necessarily control and their decisions are people. And so um, things change in people's lives. Their focus change, their uh, goals change, their personal circumstances change, their financial circumstances change, health, they get hit by buses, unfortunately. I mean, all the different things, right? And I say that a little tongue in cheek, but literally we, we do have those conversations about, you know, what about the, the, you know, hit by the bus kind of syndrome and or situation. And, you know, I think that uh, you know there's there's a there's a way to do this in in a in a capacity that makes a lot of sense. However, you know, and we'll we'll get into this, and and I've spoken a lot about this uh, this framework that I use when thinking about this. But you know, making sure that um, you almost have the same type of of values and and goals um, as the the partners that you're bringing in and or doing business with is extremely important. But and, and I will just say this, the the but being, you know, you don't always need partners, okay? You don't always need partners. And uh, some of the most successful, actually three of the most successful investors that I know have never taken partners. Are they the largest investors? No. Are they um, the biggest scale of portfolio? No. But they are the most successful um, in, that, in that regard. So I'll leave it at that and uh, let the other guys, you know, jump in. But um, I think it's an extremely important topic that we are covering today. And I can speak at lengths all day about this because I've lived it firsthand. Yeah, when I when I first got started in, in real estate back in 2013, give or take, I was having a conversation with my grandfather. And that was one of the first things he told me was never partner with anyone, do everything oh, yeah. on your own. 
And I was like, uh, you just had a couple of bad partnerships. I'm going to go figure these partnership thing, you know, this partnership thing out. I'm so smart. <clears throat> um, man, did I have, I learned my lesson a couple of times and, and you know, it's funny, like, um, the, the deal, I mean, let me start off with an anecdote. So last year we closed out a deal, a syndication and did unbelievably well, right? It was like 30% plus IRR for the investors. I ended up walking away with a $400,000 check. But it was two and a half years worth of work. I was signed on to the debt. I had to deal with all of these investors, partners. And the only reason that we ended up exiting at that price is because somebody came along and offered us a dumb number. Yeah, I mean, we were planning on being in this deal for another 10 years. I was going to have to put a lot more work into it. And so I kind of looked back and I was like, man, for the the amount of stress that I took on having to do everything and carry this partnership, what could I have done in two and a half years to make 400 grand? Oh, I could have built four single family homes by myself and had zero stress to deal with. I mean, it you know, it it really put that into perspective of like, oh yeah, maybe I don't necessarily need partnerships to grow. Maybe I'm not talking we're not talking about doing 10, 20, 30 million dollar deals. But I'll make just as much money, if not more, doing smaller deals on my own and be in a much happier, better place. I think that there is this very toxic side of commercial real estate where people love to talk about assets under management or how many units they own. And I think to a certain extent, that's valid, right? Because it, it helps you at least gauge and understand, OK, what level of commercial real estate is this person in? Do they have one strip center or do they have like a thousand multifamily units, right? You're kind of having different conversations with different people at that point. But man, it, it is not always about the numbers. Um, but Matt, I'm going to kick it over to you now. What's uh, what's important to you about partnerships or not important? Yeah, this is such a huge topic. We could go so many different directions with it. Um, to me, from my point of view, one of the basic ways I think about partnerships is it's a form of leverage, right? Which is one of the things that got me excited about real estate when I first got into it was leverage. So partnerships can be pretty exciting for that reason, right? But you know, leverage comes with a pretty substantial amount of risk too. So that's one of the basic frameworks I think about with partnerships. So for me personally, in my experience and experience of some of my clients is they've been able to use the leverage of partnerships to get into be deals they never could have possibly gotten into at that stage in their career, right? Or to be able to do deals with none of their own money, for example, um, that they couldn't have afforded to do without the partner or vice versa, right? Sometimes the partners bring money to the table and get access to a deal and education that they'd never have the opportunity to be a part of before. So there's really tremendous, I mean, there's unbelievable upside, almost unlimited upside to partnerships, but there's also extreme risk too. Um, and a lot of that risk comes down to the, who you're partnering with, right? But it also comes down to, you know, what was referenced earlier, you know, a partnership is a tool and not every, you know, not everything is a nail, right? If a partnership's a hammer, not everything's a nail. So there are plenty of times where you can get leverage or you can get the things you're trying to accomplish with a partnership in other ways and decrease your risk. And I think uh, early on, especially, um, people don't, you know, maybe the opposite of your grandfather, people think the opposite of partnerships. They think nothing can go wrong, right? And, and that's how a lot of people start their career out and they have to find the hard way that, there's very much an ugly side to partnerships. And there's so many ways, you know, there's so many ways that partnerships can go wrong and only a few ways they can go right, to be honest. <laughs> you know, there's not like, there's not that many ways that a partnership goes right, but there's almost an unlimited way, amount of ways that partnerships can go wrong. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's so many different directions we can take it because, you know, there are alternatives to partnerships you need to think about. There are some situations you don't want to, you know, be in partnerships in. There are people you don't want to partner with and do want to partner with. There are deals you don't want to partner on and do want to partner on, you know. So there's a lot to unpack. And uh, at the end of the day, nothing nothing overcomes a bad per person as a partner, right? So that's probably the number one thing I see over and over again is your work. If you're working with really high quality character people as a partner, then there's a there's a lot of um, mitigation there. If you're working with a partner who's a bad actor, you're probably in trouble almost no matter what you do. Yeah, I mean, that's the worst. It, like having a bad partner that is actually a bad actor 
it's like uh, I mean, it's like having a, a Russian spy in your government, right? Like they they know all of the insider information and they can do things to you that nobody else ever could. Uh, and I've had that happen to me before. I mean, it's look, I, I've had you know bad partnerships where the partner was actively sabotaging the deal so that they could benefit, uh, which is kind of absolutely wild. I've had bad partnerships where the partners were passively sabotaging the deal. Like it, it, here's here's the here's the thing that I found. The only way that I can make a, a partnership very successful uh, thus far, right? And to be fair, I mean, I haven't partnered with every single person that I know in, in real estate. Is if I'm the one that does it, <laughs> that's the <laughs> only way. That's the only way I've found. Like partners are great because they can help me sign on debt. They can help me raise some capital. But as soon as the deal, the capital raise is closed, I might as well just count them off, like write them off as a partner. Um, and I feel like there are people out there that know that there are other partners like that, right? So they take advantage of it, of this like, well, I know Tyler's not going to let this project fail, so I'm just going to let him do all the work. I don't really have to do anything. I get to just sit here and benefit from it. I see that all the time. Um, let's let's talk about like determining roles. Because when when you're getting into a partnership, making sure that you actually have defined roles and responsibilities is unbelievably important. It's one thing that I see most people not even talk about, or maybe they'll they'll have a high level conversation about it, but nobody puts it into writing, which is mind boggling to me. But when you're getting into a partnership, I mean, we could talk about general partners, limited partners. We could talk about active versus passive. We could talk about you know asset manager versus uh, you know I mean, whatever you want to call it, like investor relations. Matt, how important is it to have that conversation on the front end, and how how should people memorialize that? Yeah, yeah, it's super important, and and maybe as a part of the conversation about roles, one of the first things people need to understand is the basic liability principles of a general partnership, because what a lot of people don't understand when they get into their first general partnerships is if you're just in a, a flat general partnership, you've got what we call typically joint and several liability. You're sharing liability with your partners. So if your partner goes off and commits fraud or does this or that, you could be on the hook up for that. And especially if, for example, you're working with a newer investor and you're a high net worth investor, you know, all of all of the recovery could be from your pocket, basically. So you need to understand that. And then there are other ways to do partnerships like you reference limited, you know, limited partnerships through entities, you know, all kinds of different ways, syndications. Um, that could change that. So that's one part of the roles that's really important. I've been surprised over the years at how many people I talk to that, for example, think they have limited liability as a partner and they don't, or don't realize that they're signing off as a personal guarantor, for example. So that's some, uh, you know, some liability side. Forgive me for jumping on that first as the lawyer on the call. Um, but then just the general it's, roles too. It's your role and your responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> But, but just the general roles too, you know, like it, it's super, super important to think through that and to think through it in detail. Like I remember earlier in my career um, working with a lot of younger um, investors, people would sort of think through it, but they wouldn't really think through it deeply. Right. So like they form like a construction company together or a real estate investing company together. And it's sort of like, hey, I'm going to find the deal. And I, you know, I've got a construction background and. I'll pull permits and, you know, it's just sort of like, okay, we all got a different like line item we can put beside our names. It's slightly different than the other person, but you really need to go a lot deeper than that and do, you know, like a value assessment, right? Like what's the real value being brought by each person? And is there a fair amount of value being spread across the board? And is there real clarity about the specific tasks that one person is doing versus the other? And is that a fair balance, right? Like, is it is it really a, an equitable arrangement? Um, because if you don't do that, a lot of partnerships go bad when the partners figure out that the deal is not fa as fair as they thought it was, or when something changes and it wasn't as fair. That's why a lot of partnerships break up. Um, and then you know, of course, you got to put that in writing, no doubt, right? And you know, if you're in a partnership agreement, you need a partner. Or if you're in a partnership, you need a partnership agreement in writing. If you're in an LLC, you need an operating agreement in writing. You know, if you've got the fund or syndication, you might need a, a lot more documentation than that. Uh, you need to put it in writing. And then one way to think about it, I think is helpful is 
you know, if you, you know, everybody's got an understanding of what their partnership is and what their partnership roles are. But if you read, you know, if a third party, somebody who's not in your deal reads that document and they can't tell 100% clearly what you agreed to and what your role is, then it's up for grabs, right? It's up for debate from whoever it is that's looking at your partnership from the outside in. And that could be a judge, right? So it's, it's super important. And I think a lot of people step over, um, they step over dollars to pick up pennies from my perspective, and they don't understand the value of education too, right? By investing in these things early on in their career. And, you know, if they're lucky, they miss out on catastrophes, but if they're not, it could really push them back quite a while in their uh, investing career. Yeah. I mean, look, to, to put it in perspective as to how important it is to put everything in writing, even if you guys decide like, hey, we're actually not going to meet under the cadence of the operating agreement. Let's go ahead and send an email and memorialize that and put it in writing because another partner could come along and say, well, I wasn't told that we weren't meeting anymore and I'm missing out and I don't feel like I'm informed on what's going on. You guys are hiding. I mean, there, there's any number of things that can happen. When I was 25 years old, I did um, a development project and uh, I didn't have the money to do an operating agreement. So I trusted the developer instead of spending five or ten thousand dollars on an operating agreement because um, he told me hey if you want this memorialized you go pay for it which he knew I didn't have the money uh, instead I lost out on about four to five hundred thousand dollars because when the project was over he said oh we don't have anything in writing thanks for working on it uh, see you later I mean mind-boggling I can't really go too far into detail because we were in a lawsuit so you know that's that obviously Fortunately, in Tennessee, uh, anything in writing is considered a, a contract. So I do have in writing from him all of that stuff. But damn, I should have just spent $5,000. It would have made it a lot easier. You know what I mean? So echoing what, what Matt said there, put it all in writing. Logan, what about you? I mean, what are the, what are the primary roles as you see them going into these investment projects? 25, man. So how long has that been going on? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, well, okay. So to be fair, statute of limitations is like six years. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a more recent thing. <laughs> I got it. All right. Understood. You know what I think we're talking about here is how do we make asymmetrical bets? Meaning how do I make sure that the upside is unlimited and the downside is mitigated and or controlled? And that's really difficult to do. Uh, I'll tell you, even having operating agreements in place, you know, you still, if something happens, you still have to take that, get counsel and either arbitrate that, mediate that, or take it to court. And so that we're talking thousands of dollars, we're talking time, we're talking mental trash and headspace, all of those different things. So the best component to that and the strategy is obviously to try to avoid that. If you're in business long enough, I think that you will not avoid that. Um, that's just, we live in a litigious society and, um, you know, we, we can be sued and or taken to court for anything. So um, I think that is a part of business. Um, you know, if you're trying to do any business at, at any level and or scale. However, I think that um, just like a building needs a strong foundation, I think a real estate partnership requires a strong foundation. And one of the things that I have always been pretty matter of fact about is control provisions and any partners that I am working on, if I'm doing a deal. I have to have the control because like Tyler said, I have a hard time not being able to go affect positive change in any regard. And handing that over is very difficult. If we are signing on recourse debt and um, we are putting a partnership together. Not when I'm passively investing. That's a completely different uh, ball game. I'm I'm actually giving my control away so somebody else can go do what they're best at, and that's a completely different conversation to have. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of pressure from people um, that 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 they get put on themselves to get that first deal, you know. And and I'll just throw Grant Cardone here, you know, into the mix. Old GC. I've been reading his books for 15 years. You know, 10x rule is still probably one of my favorite books and I'm I listen to it every single year. But that guy has investors that are non accredited, uh, sending him one to $5,000 via text messages. Okay. Um, that's pretty crazy to think about, right? But that's the world um, that we live in. 
Um, but I bring I bring him up because I think that this is a you know a, a great example of saying you have to start in a hundred unit apartment complex versus hey you can start on a duplex on a five thousand square foot commercial building on a house you can start wherever why do i say that that's important well i think that's important because what you will learn through doing your own transaction figuring it out first off i I don't have the money okay well go figure that out figure out how to save your money figure out how to find uh, money on you know a, a home equity line of credit if that makes sense you know there's there's different examples and there's plenty of resources for people to think about creative financing and if you're not ready to do that and you don't have those funds and you can't get that done, that could be the world or the ethos telling you, hey, it's time to just be patient right now. But there is so much pressure from getting that first deal, being involved in a 100 plus unit multifamily property that you finally get to a point where you just relinquish all of your control, all of your ability to do anything in a transaction because somebody on the other side of that zoom call that phone call that conference is saying hey just join my team and we'll put a partnership together and and we'll do this deal together well if you do that then a lot of a lot of the benefits of actually uh, the actual real estate benefits i call it the ideal investment income depreciation equity buildup, appreciation and leverage well one of the biggest ones at least for myself and i know for you two sitting here is the depreciation benefits of real estate and as qualified real estate professionals actually being able to utilize that well if you don't sign on debt if you're not actively involved in a deal putting money into a deal guess what yeah you may be able to say i'm involved in this syndication but you have no basis in that real estate transaction if you don't know what that means go read some real estate books and or structure but simply put is you don't have any depreciation opportunities really in that in that real estate um, and, and so there's just a lot of pressure, I think, for people to get going and, and making that first jump into a, a large real estate transaction, which then actually, you know, impedes their ability to actually get to the goal that they were trying to get to by doing a bigger deal. And so I think that these things need to be thought through much more thorough, like Matt was saying, and, and, and understood from that level, because instead of doing that 100 unit deal, maybe taking a couple of years, putting some cash away and buying a really good fourplex with a conventional loan, that might be the great, a great opportunity in a great area. And then three years later, 1031 exchanging that. And by the time you're, we're sitting here five to 10 years later, you might have 25 or 50 units yourself that you can then sell. And if you want to get out of the business, go invest into a syndication or trade that up to a larger syndication yourself. I got off a phone call yesterday with a guy. He's like, I did 700 transactions before I ever raised any money privately. And I treat every single deal like it's my own money because I've done it that way. And um, I think there's a lot of merit to that. However, what we hear and what we see on a lot of shows and mentorship groups and things like that is not that, that, that part. But, you know, I'll just, I'm not gonna name anybody, but these mentorship groups, they are funnels, okay? They all go to Russell Brunson's conference they all are master quick funnel and, and they, they are in the, the $10 million club or the, the gold club, whatever it is, they're going to post it on their social media and you're going to say, what is that? And now that you did, now you're going to be retargeted by Russell Brunson for 25 years because now that they've got affiliate <laughs> links, they've got affiliate links set up for, if you click that, then yeah, you get 25 cents on every single click. If you, you know, promote this to your network, long story short, these mentorship groups are funnels for these individuals who have resources to get deal flow brought to them and to create businesses that when they're not doing real estate, they continue to uh, be able to cash flow on uh, on the merits of people who are truly trying to get into the industry. If you really want to learn it, how about going and taking some some real estate courses at your local college or um, how about checking out CCIM and really understanding financial modeling and uh, how these deals get put together. I think there's a different route. And I think if somebody takes that route, they're going to look at partnerships very differently. The, Matt, you could probably speak to this, but the Jobs Act of 20, 2012 was really what allowed, or maybe it was 2010, but it was the Obama administration is what really allowed for digital marketing and social media to really break this open into this whole new you know, product service based you know, industry. And um, a lot of big people with big followings were able to monetize that. And that's what this is in a lot of ways, is monetizing 
you finding a deal, bringing it to them, them taking the lion's share of it, you saying, yep, I'm in a deal that has 250 units. And is that really, truly getting you closer to your goal? Um, I don't know. And I do know that uh, many of those opportunities and, and deals are not uh, you know, doing all that great because they were monetized to get deals done. So I think that's extremely important to, to be thinking about. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd want to tack on just real quick to that. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody not that long ago, and they were thinking about getting getting into a partnership. And we got into a pretty deep discussion about it. And I, I, I said, look, man, you can't delegate overcoming your fears, right? You can't delegate um, getting minimum competence in the area you're trying to go into, right? And I think that's what a lot of, you know, that's sort of what you're speaking about. I think a lot of people use um, partnerships as if it's a shortcut. And it's not a shortcut. In fact, it's like we said, it's leverage, right? So if you're playing with leverage, you actually need more sophistication. You really need to know what you're doing if you're playing with leverage. So I think that's the big mistake people make is they, you know, they don't want to overcome some fears. They don't want to make the call. They don't want to make the offer or they don't want to have the hard conversation with the contractor, whatever it is they're afraid of doing. And maybe they don't want to read the book. They don't want to get the legitimate education. They don't want to get the minimum competence. And that's not everybody, but it's just a mistake that I see a lot. And I think that's a really bad idea as far as a way to use partnerships. Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, Logan, with the, you know, starting off at 100 units, like that's such a crazy reach goal. But it's it's been so normalized by mm -hmm. real estate syndicators and the way that they talk about things. I mean, let's be honest, going from doing zero real estate to buying a 100 unit apartment complex, I mean, that's like, that's like graduating from seventh grade and, and applying to Harvard and thinking that you're going to get in, right? Like, yeah. is there one weird kid that's going to be able to do that? Sure. But the overwhelming majority of people are not going to be able to accomplish that. It's just not how it works. I mean, my first project, $575,000. It was a little 6,000 square foot, two tenant building, totally vacant, like 20 minutes outside of Nashville in a you know not so great area. And it was a great deal. You know why? Because I had to call two guys, and they both said, yeah, we'll give you $50,000 each. I rolled my commission in. We held it for two years. I sold it to one of the tenants I ended up leasing it to. It was an awesome deal. I'm not, I didn't retire off that one thing, but I also I proved to myself, one, damn, it's a lot easier to do this than I thought it was, <laughs> right? Because you like build it up so much in your head. I mean, it, this was five years into my brokerage career. I had done millions and millions of dollars of transactions for other people. I had been through that process so many times, but there's something about stepping on the other side where you're like, oh man, I can't sleep. <laughs> like there's, I gotta get this through my head. This is, this is crazy. Um, but I mean, start small, just do one and, and, and snowball it from there. It's, it's a lot easier when you just start thinking of it that way. There are plenty of 500,000 to a million dollar properties out there that if you're willing to put the work in can make for great investments. Now, uh, moving us into talking about equity splits, I'm going to throw out a question to you guys that I get asked all the time. And, and, you know, I'm sure you guys get, get it too, right? It's, Hey, Tyler, I found a really good deal. And I'm talking to this guy that I think is going to put up all of the money. How much of the equity should I get in the project or how much of the equity should I give them? How do you answer that? I want to know because I, I mean I've got a whole story about how you know about my thoughts on that. But Matt, Matt, I'm going to turn it over to you first. What's your response? <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you my response. It's the classic lawyer response. It's it depends every time because it's <laughs> it, that's just an, it's such an impossible question. You know, like it's such an impossible question. Like, okay, let me spend the time to understand your de your deal in great detail. Let me spend the time to understand your partner in great detail. Let me understand your skill set and your values in great detail. I can't do that, right? When, uh, when I mean, I've got a partnership, for example, I've got a partnership, two partnerships with the same people in it, right? And in one partnership, my role is the exact same in both of them. In fact, the second one, I'm probably more valuable because I gained some skills along the way. In the first partnership, I own 20%, in the, or excuse me, in the first one, I own 25%, in the second one, I own 20%. Well, what happened? Well, the roles adjusted slightly because of the kind of asset it was, the equity on the deal, you know, what we thought the equity was on the front end was a little bit different. We got a little bit of a seller carry difference. So there's so many pieces to the equation. At the end of the day, equity splits are subjective and they're supposed to be based on 
the partner's best assessment of, of fair, you know, fair value, right? At least that's, that's my point of view. Um, so how can I, you know, how can I possibly tell you what your value is? I don't know. So that's, but that's baked into the equation, in my opinion, of what the fair equity split should be. So, yeah, I don't really answer that question, frankly. I mean, I see the guys with like the charts where you'll take the chart and, you know, somebody gets X percentage of the deal for operating and somebody gets X percentage for, you know, managing this part and all that, which I don't, you know, I don't think it's unhelpful. I just don't think that it's really the way, you know, it's not going to get you to an exact number. It's not a science, right? So it just takes time to figure out where the value is and where your value is. And, you know, if you, if you're a deal finder, um, one deal that you find might be a triple and one deal might be a home run and you better get more equity on the home run than the triple or, or you're, you're selling yourself short. So, yeah, I mean, it's every deal is different, right? And, and it, that's important to keep in mind. There's no set formula that you can just take in every single deal and think, okay, we've got this. This is how we split it up. It's going to be the same every time. It's totally different. Logan, what about you, man? Yeah. I mean, I try to utilize the tool that Matt mentioned, right? Which is a, a split worksheet. Now, this is not the same for every single opportunity. Um, but I'm also not partnering with a whole lot of people. And um, I have really one defined uh, group that we really work with um, that we've done over seven projects with now. Um, and so we've, we've refined this to a point where we feel comfortable. But maybe what I'll do is just walk through the different components that are on this worksheet so people kind of can understand what that might look like. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about the pre-closed work, right? Who's doing the due diligence? Who sourced the opportunity? Who's doing the underwriting? Um, that's a big component to these real estate deals. We don't have a deal unless somebody brought a transaction to our table. I've had partners just went full cycle on a deal. The only thing that he did the whole time was bring the opportunity to us and we stepped in 100% and he made out pretty dang good at the end of the deal because we wouldn't have had one if he hadn't brought it to us, right? Um, then you have risk capital, right? So this is escrow. This is deposits. Um, you know, do you have to put money up for inspections and appraisals and financing and things like that? So this is money that could truly be lost, you know, in the transaction if it doesn't get consummated. And then a big one is the loan and balance sheet and liquidity um, experience because, you know, if these, a lot of deals that we do are recourse loans. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure a lot of people actually understand what that means um, and how important that is because, um, you know, I, I guess I could probably just ask anybody on the call, when's the last time you reviewed your, your loan documents and the different covenants? Um, that's a pretty serious thing to be thinking about, especially at scale. Um, you know, who's calculating or, or have you calculated how much recourse you actually have out there? Yeah, you got your fancy, you know, personal financial sheet, but, you know, what it really doesn't show is that you've got seven different loans that uh, are at 85% LTV that aren't really cash flowing and you have full recourse on all of those. That partner may look good up until the point you know what type of loans that they have actually, you know, signed on. And if they do go south, they have to you know, come up with the money and or provide the cash, you know, for that. Um, asset management, right? So investor relations, this is uh, site visits, this is doing the actual operations. Uh, and then there's obviously bringing capital to uh, the projects. What I will say about this, and Matt, I don't know if you're a securities attorney at all. I am not, and I will preface that with, with what I'm about to say. I'm not a securities attorney, but I uh, frankly think that uh, there's probably a lot of of deals being done and compensation being shared among partners that um, are acting as broker dealers in a lot of scenarios that truly aren't, you know, active participants in those in those deals. And that is a that is not just a light gray area. That is a dark gray area that uh, only really gets brought up is when something's going wrong, right? And uh, and so yeah, if you've got the Midas touch and everything's turning gold, maybe you're okay, but. Uh, most of us do not. Um, and so, I again, that's the, the the categories. But look, it's a tool to get a conversation, I think, going in the in the partnership realm, because, 
you know, there's going to be concessions on both parties and you have to be able to come to some sort of agreement. And w without mm -hmm. having a tool to be able to talk through it, you're just kind of, you know, everybody's just kind of, you know, throwing out numbers for, for what sake. And, and, uh, but if there's actually something to, to work through that has some calculations, it's a good starting point to kind of discuss, you know, I remember doing my first deal, you know, that I, I found and, um, you know, I still own this, this deal. Uh, it was a mixed use building. Uh, so I had a bagel shop on the, the main level and it's Airbnbs up top in a hot spot in Kansas city. And I remember finishing, uh, Joe Fairless's apartment syndication book. So this was probably six, six years ago, uh, five, six years ago and reading straight out of this book to this investor that, uh, I was pitching the deal to and saying, well, you know, I know that you're not here local and Airbnbs, you know, have a little bit more operational component to them. Uh, what if I was just boots on the ground here doing the asset management, working with the property management company, uh, renewing leases with the, the bagel shop? By the way, I had never done a commercial deal. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll have to figure out commercial leases at that time. Um, and for that, I'll take 25% of the deal. I'll put an acquisition fee um, on here. I brokered the deal as well. Um, you'll sign on the loan. I did not sign on the loan um, and put all the equity up into the deal. Would that be fair? And we didn't land on 25%. I think we landed on, you know, 17 or 18%. But like I found the deal. I didn't have any risk in, in regards to that deal. And I felt that was pretty well compensated for that when we go to sell. Am I going to see any cash flow on that thing? No. I mean, he gets 100% of the cash flow like he should. Right. And so I think that and we papered that thing up in a joint venture agreement and that deals worked out really great for us. And so that's a really simplified version. But at least I had two tools. I had this GP split worksheet and I had a at least uh, idea of what that might look like with an investor introduced the idea. And we came around to terms that we both felt good about and we moved forward and it's been a successful transaction. So I think having some sort of starting point and basis is extremely uh, advantageous to these conversations that you're having with uh, with potential partners. Yeah, and ju and just like anything else, right? Ask the question why. Get to the bottom of what is important to each individual person, because I've had investors give me cash that don't want any cash flow whatsoever. They want their equity, but they want a hundred percent of the depreciation. Mm -hmm. Well. That might actually work out pretty damn well for me if I'm looking at this going, you know what? I just want a cash flow play out of this. I can get my depreciation from another property. Let's go. Right. And so, I mean, there's there's so many different ways to structure it. If you just ask why, what is important to them, what matters to you and, and figure those things out. I mean, there's gosh, there's so many different ways to structure these deals. I mean, you know, typically whenever we're looking at our general partnerships, it's like, oh, 25 percent to whoever brings the deal to the table, 25 percent for you know, raising the capital, 25 per, you know, whatever. I mean, you can make things up at the end of the day. That's kind of all it is. It's whatever you and your partners are going to agree to. I hear way too often on the first deal, like, I don't have any money. I found a great deal, and I know it's a great deal because I've never done real estate before, so it's definitely a really good deal. <laughs> I want 50% of this deal, and I want my investor to put up 100% of the cash, and I want them to sign on the loan. I'm like, look, the first development project that I ever did, I had zero experience in development other than, I mean, I had some experience, but it wasn't like I had ever done a project before. I didn't have any cash and I definitely, it wouldn't have mattered if I signed on the loan. Like it wouldn't have done, it probably would have hurt the case. Uh, <laughs> and I got 10% of the deal, but I mean, and I would do that deal today. 10% of this development project with no, not having to put any money in, not having to sign on the note. All I had to do was do the sweat equity and actually run the project, pull everything together. Absolutely. I would do that all day. So don't think that 10% is too low. One thing that I think people often forget to talk about or at least consider is your risk-adjusted returns. Yeah, 50% of a project sounds great until you start to realize, oh, if this project goes wrong and I have to put up my 50% of the cash for construction overruns, or my 50% of the cash to cover the mortgage, you start to realize like, oh yeah, maybe 50% actually isn't that great. And I would rather have partners that can help me do this. So um, one thing I wanted to throw out there real quick, because I know this is a, is a question I get asked all the time by my own vendors. And again, I know you guys do too. What are your thoughts on vendors, like general contractors, architects, 
throwing in their, you know, overhead and profit and becoming a partner with you. So like, oh, I won't mark up anything. Just bring me in as a partner into your deal. Logan, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, you know, I've never done it. I've been offered that opportunity uh, quite a few times. Um, but, you know, I think introducing more complexity into that situation can be somewhat difficult. And again, if you aren't in a position to, um, you know, really pay for those services, you know, you're kind of putting yourself in a position where you're just accepting that to get something, you know, done. And how are you going to be able to really evaluate, um, you know, all of the different components? Is this person someone that I want to actually have in my deal versus somebody I need to have in there because I need the work done. And so I would hate for that to be the first time that you get a relationship going with a vendor. If this is someone we're talking about that you've known for 15, 20 years and you know their business acumen and uh, if they're not a bad actor and you've been around them, then I think it's a different conversation um, potentially. And or you could be doing them a favor by getting into one of these real estate deals because maybe they don't have the cash to be able to actually get into a deal, but they're looking for that. That that might be able to, to work. But you know, I've not been a part of that. I know there's a lot of real estate brokers that sometimes will end up rolling their commission into getting a deal done and, and getting equity that way as well. Um, I think it's just like Matt always says, it depends. And I think it can work. But my blanket answer would be, you know, I've sh shied away from that and uh, made sure that uh, I didn't introduce even more you know, people into a, a transaction. Now, if you're doing a syndication and you're raising private money and uh, you're going to have passive investors regardless um, to that, that could work, right? You know, I mean, I think that that, that could maybe be a, an opportunity where you take the fees from what that was going to cost and roll that into um, an equity situation and they are a limited partner, then yeah, I think that might be a, an easier way to, to potentially do that for sure. Matt? Yeah, from so I mean, one of the things, one of the frameworks I work off of with partnerships is is something really a like a necessary partnership role, or could it be in a you know an independent contractor role or a third party role, right? So I think that's a mistake a lot of people make is they take something that could easily be hired out or just independent contracted, and a contractor can be a great you know example of this, um, and it's really not necessary to make that person a partner. And so I'd go back to your question of why, right? Like, why are they being made a partner? Well, a lot of times people make someone like that a partner to align incentives, which that's a good idea to align incentives, but they're alternatives to partnership. So one thing you're doing when you're adding a partner typically is, um, like Logan said, not only are you increasing the complexity, but you're increasing the risk, right? You're increasing shared liability, right? So. And then, so what that means really is every time you add a general partner, your risk adjusted return is going down. It's another way to think about it, right? So, um, you know, from my perspective, it's usually not a good idea to do something like that if you can avoid it. You, there's all kinds of alternatives. You can, you know, I've got clients who will pay their contractors bonuses based on profit, right? Pay their contractors bonuses based on meeting or exceeding timelines on the project, which is usually what you're really worried about, right? Or costs, give them bonuses if the costs are lower um, or you know if they meet the cost. So there's a lot of other ways to meet that. I'm not saying it's a bad idea all the time. I just think that people don't really think through the implications a lot of times. And you should be very thoughtful when you're gonna add a partner, someone who has the ability to exercise control over your project, someone who has the ability to add shared liability to you um, I, I think it's something to avoid when possible. And, and honestly, it's one of those things where if you can do a deal without a partner or do a deal without adding an additional partner, you should, you should think through how that would be possible. Cause usually you're going to be able to keep a higher return for yourself if you don't need that person as a partner. Yeah. I mean, I, I've typically avoided it, um, for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, one going back to what Logan was saying earlier in the show, you know, getting hit by a bus syndrome. If I hire a general contractor who, you know, knocks 10% off of their price because they're going to be a partner in the deal and then they get hit by a bus and I've got to go hire another contractor at market rate, which is now going to be 10% higher than what I've budgeted in my pro forma. 
we're going to have some problems. So not only am I now having to pay more for construction, the, the heirs of my guy that just got hit by a bus still get to profit from this deal, right? So it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it, I, I think that as long as they're signing on debt, they're taking equal amounts of, of roles and responsibilities under the general partnership as, as any other partner would. Why not? Um, but you got to be very careful with it. The only reason that I would ever consider anybody like that is if I still have full override voting abilities, I will fire your ass off of this job if you don't do it right. Because it happens all the time. I mean, I've had, I've done it one time where I've had a vendor involved in one of my projects. You would think that he would have cared about cost overruns since he had to put up, you know, 12 or 15% of the capital needed for any time we had a capital call. Didn't care. I mean, he just kept running up the bill on the construction side of things and we kept having to put money back into it and we were trapped. Um, so it's, it's just something that you want to be careful of. Uh, Doster group is saying 10% is terrific. Completely agree. I mean, look, I would take 10% risk-free in any project all the time. Uh, Brent Miller is asking a pretty interesting question. Thoughts on partners bringing cash versus debt. So have you ever gone out and had your partners bring, like, instead of selling any equity, you're just bringing, uh, you know, kind of like mes debt in, right? Uh, to to fund a project. I mean, I've actually looked at doing this a couple of times, right? Go out and raise 100% debt from my investors at, you know, 10% interest, but the interest accrues and, until the project is done or until I refinance them out. I mean, there's some obvious pros and cons to this. I think that there are some great potential upsides if you think the equity is going to be worth it, but terrible potential downsides if you don't think it's going to start covering the debt. Logan, I'm going to lob it over to you. What are your thoughts on that structure? You know, I mean, the only time I have done this, and this might be a little bit of a different scenario, but anybody tried to raise capital during Christmas time? Oh, good luck. <laughs> it's really difficult. And so if your closing is in December, your capital better be raised probably before Thanksgiving. So uh, it can be a really difficult situation. So we kind of got down to the wire on a large industrial building, and I was about $500,000 short. Um, I put up some of the money, but then I called one of my buddies. I was like, hey, man, well, I'm kind of in a pickle here. I need to get this done. Um, and um, he was willing to um, bring in debt to close the transaction. And we continued to raise in January. And then two weeks later, we we had the, the equity raised out. So for, you know, really 21 days, you know, he had uh, about $500,000 into the deal um, that we had to pay interest on and a fee to get that deal completed. Um, and it was well worth it, it, you know, locking in debt at the time that we did at 5% and getting everything done was, was well worth it. It's been a great opportunity. Um, and so I've used it in that way um, on transactions very sparingly. Um, that's the only time I've really needed to do that. But in regards to raising 100% of, of debt and, and doing that, um, yeah, yeah, we, we closed the transaction um, last December and, you know, uh, again, is in December. Banks basically shut down in December as well. And, um, you know, frankly, I wasn't a very good lending time, maybe still not, but really bad in December of last year. If anybody remembers, um, it wasn't much fun. So we raised 100 percent. Well, we had we had equity, uh, but then we went out and raised the rest of the, the capital needed um, and put it on as debt. And we still haven't refinanced that. Like We're going to start refinancing process here soon. What that allowed me to do was I was able to come in close on the transaction and save, well, this depends on if in Congress it gets passed, but at the time, you know, the bonus depreciation was, what was it last year, guys? Uh, 80%? 80. Right. 80% or it was 100% last year and 80% this year? I always forget. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I everybody's right. been talking about it for so long. I yeah, think it I was 100% last year and it's 80% now. Yeah, okay. So I uh, was able to save that 100% de de bonus depreciation. Uh, and that was a big, you know, emphasis of doing that. We could have just, you know, continued to to go on on the on the project and close in January, but um, raise that in debt and close on the transaction. What that allowed me to do was capture that bonus appreciation benefit, but also um, I was able to get in there and negotiate with these leases. And so now I've extended uh, three or four leases in the shopping center. And I'm going to be able to go to, and I have enough capital to do some capex. You know, did the parking lot already. 
And so I'm going to be able to go to the lender and say, well, you know, we've leased up some space. We've renewed some major leases in the shopping center. We've done some CapEx improvements. And now that project is much more uh, financeable from a bank standpoint than it was when we bought it. So some, somewhat of a, of a bridge loan just from our own, you know, investors and, and got it done um, in that way. Uh, but it's not a full, you know, it's not a long term, you know, capital capital plan for us, just simply a, um, you know, a, a short term situation to get a good a good loan on it here later this year. Yeah, I, I recently looked at a, a mobile home park down in uh, Mississippi, I think, where we, we were actually entertaining it. Um, although it's not necessarily like right in my wheelhouse. I was like, yeah, it seems like a pretty good cash flowing opportunity. And it was only like 450 grand or 500 grand. So I just sent an email out to my investor list. I was like, Hey, I'll give you guys 10% interest. Um, you know, debt position, first position on the property. Um, you know, personally guaranteed if anybody wants it. And man, I mean, I raised like one and a half million dollars in eight hours. Um, ended up not going through with that project. Uh, basically because it was the mobile home parks are really, really hit or miss. And most of them are mess. Um, so, uh, I decided it was not up to our standards, but, um, it did show me that a lot of our investors are actually interested in that type of structure, which I hadn't tested out before. Um, and I like yeah. that for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, if I don't have to have any other partners, any other seats at the table, damn, does that make my life so much easier? I, I prefer that. I mean, look, I've got some great friends that would be great partners, but at the same time, it's just so much easier when you're the only one that has to make the decision. First of all, I'm terrible at communicating. That cuts out having to send emails to people or text messages or phone calls. Like I get to just you know talk up inside my head and it's done, right? Um, but you know, it, it, also you get to keep 100 percent of the upside. So. Matt, what are your thoughts, though? No, I mean, I love it. I mean, the other thing I do, I mean, I, I say I love it. I love replacing partnerships with debt, right? So especially for really good deals. If I find an amazing deal, like a really good deal, my objective is to find a way to keep all of it because it, if I really believe in it that much. So a lot of times I'll do that via seller financing, right? We bought two buildings that probably would have normally been thought of from partnership raising capital perspective by most investors, but we kept it all ourselves by leveraging it with increased seller financing. So what that allowed me to do is to take the project and keep all of it when under, you know, this model, I would have probably had to give 25 to 50% of away based on the numbers. So, you know, but that's a double edged sword, right? Because you're taking on all the risk for yourself. And, uh, but with a great deal, it can be awesome to replace a partnership with uh, with debt, in my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, it looks like, uh, I mean, we're going to have to make this a part one and part two because I'm looking at our next you know, couple of talking points. I'm like, there's not a chance we're going to cover these in seven minutes. So, yeah, <laughs> Doster's like, Tyler talks inside his head. Yes. Yeah, I do. I much prefer talking inside my head than talking outside of my head, which is hilarious because I have this podcast, but <laughs> I much prefer silence. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's pick this up in the next episode. We'll make it a part two. We'll dive into um, aligning your goals, doing your due diligence on partners, and common pitfalls. I mean, that, that episode might actually be more important <laughs> than this one because doing your due diligence on partners, I had to have my con a, a conversation with somebody about this today. They came to me and they were like, Hey, uh, you know, something weird is going on. This guy said that his bank account's frozen, but he was supposed to wire $5.6 million today. And I was like, who froze his bank? And they're like, oh, the bank did. I was like, that doesn't happen. Banks don't just freeze bank accounts. Like, it's either the FBI, the IRS, or something bigger. Turns out the dude's a scammer. <laughs> Happens all the time in this business. So you have to do your due diligence. We'll dive into that in part two. Appreciate you all for joining us. Logan, Matt, we'll see you guys later. Thanks, guys. This episode of the Commercial Real Estate Investor Podcast is brought to you by CRE Launch Pro. This online commercial real estate program is designed to take you from beginner to pro commercial real estate investor with access to all of my courses, our online community, and monthly group coaching calls. Learn how to confidently buy your first commercial property today at www.crelaunchpro.com.